Today I will present uh, some of our work uh, on uh, HMGB1. Uh, we've been uh, involved in studying this protein uh, for the past few years so with uh, uh, Professor Bianchi, the Instituto San Raffaele. And uh, uh, our work has been in three different areas, uh, cardiac tissue regeneration, uh, skin wound dealing in diabetes, and skeletal muscle repair. My talk today will focus on cardiac tissue regeneration. Uh, and uh, I've organized a presentation to show you some uh, old data uh, to set the stage, and uh, some more recent data, and also data which is still incomplete and uh, still work in progress. So you will excuse me if uh, uh, some experiments uh, will appear unfinished. But uh, uh, some of them might represent a basis to start a collaboration since are the more recent things that uh, we're doing. So HMGB1 is a, a small protein which is found in the nucleus of all cells and it has been studied initially because it binds DNA, embeds DNA, and via this mechanism it modulates the gene expression. Then it was found that HMGB1 could also be present in the extracellular space. In fact, it could be released by necrotic cells and it could also be released by immunocompetent cells as a late mediator of inflammation. Once HMGB1 is in the extracellular space, it can bind the receptor for advanced glycation and products and toll like receptors 2, 4, 9. And via these receptors, it can modulate cell function. There were a number of studies be before we got into the field that uh, gave hints that, that HMGB1 might be useful uh, in tissue regeneration. Uh, since uh, it was uh, a mechanism through which a cell could signal other cells uh, that there was a problem going on and that repair was needed. So in the first data set I will show you has to do with HMGB1 in the setting of uh, acute myocardial infarction. In uh, these experiments we use the mouse model of myocardial infarction. Here uh, um, the left coronary artery is ligated in the mouse, and four hours after coronary ligation, HMGB1, exogenous HMGB1, is injected in the border zone. Then the animals were followed for a period up to four weeks. In this uh, cross section of the left ventricle, you can see the effect of HMGB1 injection. Here you have uh, the septum, which has been spared by the myocardial infarction. And here, indicated by the arrow heads, you have the infarcted left ventricular wall. You can see that it is fairly thin in comparison to the septum, but that it stains red for alpha sarcomeric actin and the myocardial cells expressing alpha sarcomeric actin are live cells. In the control hearts instead, what you find is that the infarcted wall is characterized by a very large scar in gray and white, but there is a rim of myocytes which have survived in the endocardium. Once we looked a higher magnification at the infarcted wall of hearts treated with HMGB1, we find myocardial cells expressing alpha sarcomeric actin. In some of the nuclei, we find expression of MF2C. And the one point that has to be realized is that these myocardial cells are fairly small. Uh, an adult cardiac myocyte is around uh, seven micrometers in length in its long axis. These cells are around uh, seven, 10, 12 micrometers in length along uh, the long axis. Uh, this problem of uh, small myocardial cells has been found by a number of investigators who work in regenerative medicine. When you transplant the cells into the heart, the new myocardial cells are formed. When you give other drugs like IGF-1 and the hepatocyte growth factor, and new myocardial cells are formed, one characteristic is that the myocardial cells are fairly small. Now, we wanted to focus on CK positive cells. You are familiar with the work by Pierre Anversa, who a few years ago identified uh, resident stem cells in the heart. Those cells were positive for CK. And here you have an example of uh, a CK positive cell in green, expressing also KI67, indicating cell proliferation. And uh, here you can see the cell 
the CK positive cell surrounded by myocardial cells in red and the other nuclei are stained in blue. So we wanted to focus on this cell type. We counted CK positive cells in the heart in the absence of myocardial infarction and in the presence of myocardial infarction. So under control conditions, in the absence of MI, certain number of CK positive cells are present. If you give HMGB1 in the absence of MI, this number increases. Upon coronary artery ligation, here we're looking 24 hours after MI, the number of CK positive cells increases under control conditions from here to here, but HMGB1 amplifies this effect. So one clear response to HMGB1 treatment given acutely after myocardial infarction, after coronary artery ligation, is an increase in CK positive cells and also an increase in double positive CK to KI67 positive cells. What about function? Uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with the, oops, wrong button. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this type of tracings. This is an M-mode echocardiography. So here is what the echocardiogram looks like uh, in a control mouse before myocardial infarction. Here you have the anterior wall, and you can see that it comes down and up, down and up with each cardiac cycle. In black, you have the inside of the left ventricle. It's like looking into a well. And then you have uh, the septum posteriorly, which moves toward the center of the left ventricle, which is cardiac cycle. After coronary ligation, the anterior wall is infarcted, as you have seen before. So it is motionless. There is no movement here. The left ventricle is dilated in black. You can see the increase in left ventricular wall diameter here, from here to here. And the septum continues to move. In HMGB1 treated hearts, the dilation is less than in control hearts and the infarcted anterior wall preserves some motion. This translates into an improvement in function. By uh, looking at the echocardiograms, you can quantify the, the data and look at the ejection fraction. The ejection fraction in a normal mouse is around 80%, and this is in the sham operated animals. If we look at the four-week time point, that's four weeks after coronary ligation, you can see that the ejection fraction has markedly decreased, is markedly less in the control animals, and that HMGB1, to some extent, has uh, improved the outcome and the ejection fraction. It is somewhat preserved better than in control. These animals also underwent a cardiac catheterization. You can pass a catheter through the carotid artery into the left ventricle and measure pressures. One uh, important uh, pressure to look at is the left ventricular and diastolic pressure. This is the pressure inside the left ventricle at the end of the diastole. This pressure in mice, like in humans, uh, is around four or five millimeters of mercury. When uh, the function of the heart deteriorates, the left ventricular diastolic pressure increases. So immediately after coronary ligation, this is uh, one week after coronary ligation. There's been a marked in, a, a increase in left ventricular diastolic pressure. But this has been uh, contained, inhibited, by in the hearts treated with HMGB1. So again, let's look at the four-week time point. In these animals, there has been a marked increase in left ventricular and diastolic pressure under control conditions, partially inhibited by HMGB1 treatment. So, there has been clearly uh, an improvement in function in, uh, uh, and an increase in CK positive cell uh, number in the HMGB1 treated hearts. What is the effect of HMGB1 on these cells in vitro? Uh, to be honest, we didn't find much. Uh, and that's an experience that uh, everybody working with HMGB1 has had in different areas. The uh, HMGB1 works much better in vivo than it does in vitro. The only thing that we were able to identify as a, an HMGB1 response in vitro in CK positive cells was an improvement in migration in the body and chamber assay. There might be reasons for that, and uh, I will come back to this point uh, uh, later on. 
The other point we wanted to address is whether HMGB1 had an effect on endothelial cells. In order to regenerate a tissue, you need to have, uh, like the heart, you, know, you need to have uh, new myocardial cells, but you also need to bring oxygen and blood to those cells. So you need to have an angiogenic action. And we wanted to see whether HMGB1 had such an action. So we, looked, we did experiments in UVEC. We found that, that HMEG1 exposure increased the ERK and JNK phosphorylation with a peak in the response at the 15 minute time point. Then we looked at UVEC plated on metrogel. Metrogel are, are reconstituted basement membrane proteins. You can uh, put the metrogel in a petri dish and then you can seed endothelial cells on the metrogel and those cells will stop proliferate and they will form tube-like structures. So this is looked at by people in the field as an in vitro angiogenesis assay. So if you take cells and you put them in complete growth medium with a number of growth factors, they will form capillary-like structures. If you will put them in medium containing BGF, they will also form those structures. And the same thing happened with HMGB1. J and K and ERK inhibitors prevented the formation of these capillary-like structures. We then did another matrigel experiment in vivo. And in this experiment, you take matrigel. Matrigel is liquid at 4 degrees Celsius and becomes a gel at 37 degrees Celsius. So in this angiogenesis assay, you can take metagel, you supplement it with a growth factor of interest. In our case, it was HMGB1. Then you inject the gel subcutaneously in mouse. And one to two weeks later, you remove the gel plug, and you look at it histologically, looking for new blood vessel development. In the uh, initial paper which described this assay, they also looked at the hemoglobin content as a quick uh, assay to determine whether angiogenesis had occurred. But it turned out that, that when you look at hemoglobin, if the blood vessels are leaky, you can have an increase in hemoglobin and not associated with an increase in blood vessels. So people tend to count blood vessels uh, in the marginal plug. And that's the response to HMGB1. It did increase the number of blood vessels in the marginal plug, indicating that there was a direct action on endothelial cells uh, and that this effect was proangiogenic. Uh, one question that we wanted to ask, also because we were somewhat puzzled uh, by the lack of an effect of HMGB1 on CKID-positive cells in vitro, the uh, small effect that we noted was just on migration, was whether there was a, a paracrine action. So we took uh, human cardiac fibroblasts that you can easily uh, isolate from cardiac specimens coming from the operating room. So we took these cardiac fibroblasts, treated them with the HMGB1, and then we examined the condition medium for the presence of soluble factors. And indeed, we found an increase in VGF, a number of interleukins, TNF-alpha, uh, interferon gamma. This condition medium also enhanced the migration of CKID positive cells in the body and chamber assay, and enhanced BRDU incorporation by these cells. So we thought that uh, maybe what we were observing in vivo in the mouse heart was due both to direct action of HMGB1 on the CK positive cells, but also to a paracrine effect due to factors released from the cardiac fibroblasts. So the summer of this first part, as I mentioned, the, the part of notch signaling is still ongoing. Uh, in the context of an acute myocardial infarction, HMG1 does cause, uh, does induce myocardial regeneration, and this effect uh, appears to be mediated by cardiac CKID positive cells, factors released by cardiac fibroblasts, and also by an angiogenic response of the endothelial cells. The three cell types working together uh, lead to myocardial regeneration and an improvement in function. More recently, we have uh, started working also on a different model. That's a heart failure model. Uh, this model, again, is uh, related to myocardial infarction. In this case, uh, the protocol is different. The coronary artery is ligated, 
Then we wait three weeks before treating the heart. In the first uh, part of my presentation, I've shown you the results of hearts injected with HMGB1 at the time of coronary ligation, four hours later. Here we're looking three weeks later. The treatment is given three weeks later, and then the animals are followed for an additional four weeks. When the animals are treated with HMGB1, they already are in heart failure. So what is the effect on the ejection fraction? Let's look at the seven week time point. This time point is seven weeks after myocardial infarction and four weeks after HMGB1 treatment. Sham operated animals, ejection fraction is around 80%, markedly decreasing in control animals. There has been an improvement in HMGB1 treated hearts, which is statistically significant. We don't know what would have happened if we had followed these animals for two or three months, we had to terminate the experiments uh, uh, four weeks after treatment. Uh, one point that I want to emphasize is that uh, control and HMGB1 treated animals before the HMGB1 treatment uh, had a similar uh, ejection fraction. So this improvement is not due to poor matching of the two mice population. What about hemodynamics? This is the left ventricular and diastolic pressure. As I've shown you before, it does increase with uh, myocardial infarction, with heart failure. Uh, you, I want to point out that here, the increase in left ventricular uh, diastolic pressure and diastolic pressure is somewhat higher than the one that I've shown you before. When it gets to 25, 26 millimeters of mercury, the animals go into pulmonary edema. HMGB1 caused a small improvement in left ventricular and diastolic pressure and also a small improvement in left ventricular developed pressure, which increased in the HMG1 treated hearts. Now, the morphometric analysis showed some interesting results, I thought more interesting than the functional data. First of all, there was a significant improvement in wall thickness. HMGB1, four weeks after injection, had caused an improvement, a thicker infarcted left ventricular wall. Chamber volume was lower in HMGB1 treated hearts, and consequently, the static free wall stress and the static septal wall stress had both improved following HMGB1 treatment. So there was a, an effect on function, but also on volume and the remodeling of these hearts. So, oops. So HMGB1 treatment, improvement in injection fraction, improvement in left ventricular diastolic pressure, in developed pressure, and improvement in uh, morphometry. This is a, a representative image of what happens uh, to the infarcted left ventricular wall in these animals. Under control conditions, you see the scar, and then here you see surviving myocardial cells uh, in the endocardium. In HMGB1 treated hearts, the wall is thicker, myocytes survive in the endocardium, but you find a number of islands constituted by myocardial cells, these ones that are absent uh, in the control hearts. And here you can see them in a higher magnification. If you look at those cells at uh, uh, higher magnification with appropriate stain, again you find small cardiomyocytes, some express KI67, some cells incorporated BRDU, and cells are beginning to express connexin 43. As you know, connexin 43 is a protein present in the gap junctions and is fundamental in excitation contraction coupling because it carries electrical impulse from a cell to another cell. So uh, after an acute MI, the amount of connexin 43 in the infarcted area is much decreased and for a regenerative therapy intervention, it is important that connexin 403 turns to be expressed again. There is a progressive increase, indeed, in connexin 403 with time. Now, this analysis was carried out in collaboration with uh, Pier Anversa, one of my postdocs who went uh, over to his lab to perform this analysis, and then we completed it in Rome. Uh, we tried to quantify the myocardial regeneration through a detailed morphometric analysis. So we are looking at the infarcted area and we are looking at the myocardial cells in the infarcted wall. 
there's been an increase in myosin number in, H in response to HMGB1 treatment. If you quantify the myocardial volume present, you can see that uh, it is very low in the infarcted area, in the control mice, and significantly increased in response to HMGB1 treatment. And here we have quantified myocyte size. And uh, you look at the distribution of the volume of those newly formed myocardial cells. A in adult uh, myocardial cells, as I mentioned before, is bigger than one of these cells. It's around 17,000, 15 to 18,000 cubic micrometers. These newly formed myocardial cells are very small. They're around 500 cubic micrometers, with a range from 70 to 2,000 cubic micrometers. So indeed, they are small. And again, we don't know what would have happened to their size if we waited for another couple of months before sacrificing the animals and performing the analysis. What about angiogenesis, which is a key event in the myocardial regeneration? Here we're looking at arterial length density. These are arterials 4 to 40 micrometers in diameter. They stain positive for alpha smooth muscle actin. And if you look at the scar area, you see that uh, the number of arterials is low in control. This is what you have in sham operated mice. So lower in control mice, uh, back to normal in HMGV1 treated mice. And here is the effect on collagen. Now, collagen uh, is obviously present in the scar. It is uh, uh, a tissue that you can quantify. And uh, in the scar, it represents around 75% of the tissue. There is a 14% decrease in response to HMGB1 treatment. And this is a significant difference. When uh, you think then about uh, remodeling and a decrease in collagen, you have to, to think about the mechanism responsible for this event. And uh, the first thing that comes to mind are matrix metalloproteases, which are involved in uh, extracellular matrix remodeling and digestion. Here we looked at two important metalloproteases, MMP9 and MMP2. So in the upper panel, you have the messenger RNA levels for MMP9 under control conditions following MI in the border area, in the infarcted area, and in response to HMGB1 treatment. You can see the marked increase in messenger RNA levels in response to HMGB1. MMP2 messenger RNA did increase following myocardial infarction, both in the border area and the infarcted area, but there was no significant response upon exposure to HMGB1. This pattern is reflected also in the MMP's protein levels. If you look at proteins and you focus on the infarcted area in the absence and in the presence of HMGB1, there is a marked increase in MMP9 from here to here, but no really significant difference in MMP2 in the, in the protein level. This is the average data for the protein. And here instead is the activity. Once you look at activity, MMP's activity, you find an increased activity both for MMP9 and for MMP2. So the pattern is different. MMP9, the messenger RNA increases, the protein increases, the activity increases. MMP2, messenger RNA and protein don't change, but the activity does increase. One mechanism which might cause this uh, pattern is uh, a change in the expression of TIMPs. These are tissue inhibitors of metalloproteases. They belong to a family in which there are a number of them, one, two, three, four, and they act uh, on different matrix metalloproteases. So we wanted to look at TIMPs, and um, we wanted to focus on TIM3 because TIM3 is uh, abundantly expressed in the heart. It is modulated upon exposure uh, uh, to in the presence of myocardial infarction. So here we are looking at uh, TIM3. This is what you have in uh, sham operated mice. In the presence of infarct, there's been uh, on the average a decrease from the average data. Uh, 
But TIM3, in response to HMGV1, it has markedly decreased, as reflected in the Western blot and by the average result. So we had a clear indication that TIM3 that acts on MMP2N9 was inhibited by HMGV1. What might be the mechanism for uh, uh, TIM3 inhibition? We thought that microRNA might play a role. You are familiar, of course, with uh, uh, the microRNAs that uh, are uh, present in the myocardium, in the heart, it are modulated upon myocardial infarctions, and you know how they work. These are small non-coding RNAs, approximately 22 nucleotides in length. They target messenger RNAs for cleavage or translational repression. The ultimate result is a decrease in the protein being produced. Uh, there are a number of microRNAs which have been involved uh, in uh, myocardial uh, infarction in a number of studies in infarction and remodeling. So we looked uh, at many of them. And uh, this is what we found by looking both at the border area and infarct area, by looking at different microRNAs. These are most, uh, you know, some of the better characterized. Um, you will notice here that MIR-29 ABC, this MIR-29 family, under our experimental conditions, it's not modulated. And uh, there is a paper by Eric Olson and Eva Van Roy that shows instead that uh, MIR-29 is indeed modulated in myocardial infarction. There is a major difference between uh, our work and their work, which was published in PNAS in 2008, uh, is that they looked three days after myocardial infarction. We're looking uh, three weeks, we're looking 24 days after myocardial infarction. So the timing is completely different. The directional changes in these microRNAs are the one, similar to the ones that have been published. One important point, though, is that HMEGB1 had no effect on any of them. They changed in response to myocardial infarction. HMEGB1 treatment made no significant difference in these microRNAs. But there was a microRNA which was uh, markedly modulated and that's MIR-206. So here we're looking at MIR-206 expression. We're looking at this expression in the in sham operated mice, and then in the border area, in the infarcted area, where it does increase, as it has been reported to do. And upon treatment with HMGB1, there is a profound increase, in both the border and infarcted area. This is around 20, 25 fold increase. We wanted to see whether we could uh, uh, duplicate, or reproduce this experiment in vitro. And uh, we studied ourselves both under normoxic and hypoxic conditions. These experiments were carried out in cardiac fibroblasts. And uh, also under these conditions, MIR-206 increase in response to HMGB1. You will notice that here the increase is uh, 1.5 fold, uh, so around uh, 30 to 60 percent, while here the increase is around 20 fold. Again, the response to HMGB1, as I mentioned before, is always been reported to be more pronounced in, uh, in vivo than in vitro. So, HMGB1 does increase uh, MIR 206. What does HMGB1 do to TIM3? TIM3 in vitro is decreased, and this is apparent under hypoxic condition. It's borderline under normoxic conditions. That's for the messenger RNA. Similarly, for TIM3 protein, the effect under hypoxic conditions is much more pronounced, and the decrease occurs. Now, as I was trying to figure out this data, um, uh, I had a conversation with Marco Bianchi, who, who told me about some recent results that uh, they had obtained in his lab and uh, one of his colleagues' labs, showing that HMGB1 can be present in reduced and in an oxidized form. And when it is reduced, it is uh, uh, very effective. When it is oxidized, it, lose the, it loses uh, its, uh, its action. So what we thought that uh, maybe one explanation for the loss of an effect in vitro and its partial preservation under hypoxic condition was that uh, maybe in vivo we were injecting the reducing forms. We were, in fact, injecting the reducing form. That maybe that was having a full action. In vitro, maybe 
the form that we were injecting was partially oxidized, and for that reason, it lost some of its effectiveness, accounting for this type of result, and maybe accounting also for the partially preserved response under hypoxic conditions. Of course, that's just an hypothesis, but uh, um, something that we thought about uh, while discussing with Marco Bianchi about this uh, in vitro and in vivo result. So the other point then uh, was to examine whether MIR-206 modulated TIM3. So in these uh, experiments performed in vivo, in, vi in vitro, in cardiac fibroblasts, we overexpressed MIR-206 and we looked at TIM3 messenger RNA and protein levels. And we had indeed an inhibition in TIM3 by overexpressing MIR-206. The uh, effect of HMGB1 to decrease TIM3 was partially rescued in vitro by exposure to anti mir 206 So at this point, we wanted to ask whether this effect of uh, uh, mir 206 on TIM3 was a direct effect or indirect. And in order to do these experiments, you use this kind of assay, this luciferase reporter assay, in which uh, the uh, seed region for MIR-206 was coded, uh, was um, uh, inserted, sorry, the, the seed region uh, of in the 3' prime for uh, MIR-206 and the TIM-3 3' prime UTR containing that seed region were inserted into a, a construct uh, uh, having luciferase as a reporter. And the other reporter, was a reporter in which uh, the seed region had been deleted from the team 3, <coughs> 3 prime UTR. So here we're looking at uh, luciferase uh, activity under control conditions in uh, hex cells, 293 hex cells, uh, when the cells uh, had fourth expression of this construct containing the seed region for MIR-206, the luciferase decreased and when we use the construct in which the seed region was deleted, the luciferase was similar to control, indicating then that the TIM3 is a direct target of MIR-206. Now, in order to close this loop, we need to do in vivo experiments in which MIR-206 will be injected in vivo in mice with myocardial infarction being treated with HMGB1 and show that HMGB1 loses its, effective, its effectiveness uh, by using this antagonist. So the conclusions are that HMGB1 administration in failing hearts attenuates ventricular remodeling and improves LV function. This effect is associated with enhanced tissue regeneration. HMGB1 modulates MPs and TIM3 axis. HMGB1 enhances MIR-206 expression and MIR-206 dependent inhibition of TIM3. I want to conclude by showing you the colleagues who have collaborated uh, in this work. Federica Limana has performed uh, all the in vivo experiments. She's worked closely with Antonia Germani and a number of other colleagues uh, have uh, participated both at IDI, uh, Piero and Jan Castura in Boston, and Dr. Romani at the Mendel Institute in Rome. Thank you for your attention.